With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, environmentalists are disappointed in the site's reservoir, clearing a regulatory challenge. We'll have more on that, but we start today with AM Radio. AM Radio plays an important part in the lives of rural Americans. Chad Smith has more on the effort to keep AM Radios in U.S. automobiles. American vehicle manufacturers announced plans to remove AM radio from new electric vehicles. The AM radio for every vehicle act in Congress would prevent that from happening. Emily Buckman, Director of Government Affairs for the American Farm Bureau Federation, talks about the importance of AM radio. AM radio is important for all America because farmers, ranchers, and rural residents rely on it as a source of weather, commodity, and national farm policy updates. Access to radio is critically important for America's producers, especially in times of emergency. For those who work mostly out in the open, often miles from home, response time is critical. Members need a reliable form of communication to access critical information during those times. Buckman says auto manufacturers previously cast doubt on the future of AM radio, but Congress is considering a legislative fix. Last year, several automakers announced they had removed or planned to remove broadcast AM radio receivers from EVs due to interference generated by electric batteries. Ford Motor Company even went so far as to claim they were removing AM radio from all vehicles. They later reversed that decision. They are considering legislation that would require the Department of Transportation require automakers to maintain AM broadcast radio in their new vehicles at no additional charge. Farmers and ranchers are encouraged to get involved in the push to keep AM radio available in rural America. If farmers and ranchers want to ensure AM radio remains available in their vehicles, I would encourage everyone to reach out to their lawmakers in the U.S. House and Senate to urge support for the AM radio in every vehicle. Farmers and ranchers can help by responding to the action alert on the Farm Bureau website. For information, go to fb.org forward slash action alert. Chad Smith, Washington. While overall ag exports are expected to drop this year, not all the export news is bad. Gary Crawford has more. The latest U.S. Department of Agriculture ag trade forecast is for this current fiscal year, 2024. It's projecting U.S. ag exports to fall by another 4.5% from last year. And we're seeing a bit more softness in trade than we previously anticipated especially for bulk commodities like corn and soybeans. But USDA's chief economist Seth Meyer says the news in this forecast is not all bad. There are some U.S. commodities that are expected to do better than last year on the export market. Most of those are in the so-called high-value category. We're looking at an increase in overall value of beef exports, an overall increase in the value of pork exports, and also perhaps an increase in the value of U.S. dairy exports. On the beef side... For beef, it's largely a price. It is a price move, right? We're in a contraction phase of the cattle cycle, so our value of exports are rising with price. I think those are good markets for us in the beef sector where we export beef to some high-value places. I think we want to make sure we keep those. Even though we're in a contraction phase in the cattle cycle, that's our real challenge, but it's a good product. We want to be able to export that high-quality beef. And that seems to be going well as world demand for livestock products continues strong. So strong that USDA has added almost a billion dollars to its overall forecast for U.S. dairy, poultry, beef, and pork exports. Those are expected to total $38.5 billion this year. But beyond livestock, there are other products expected to do better than last year, including fruits, vegetables, and tree nuts. And also one non-food product, and that's ethanol. For ethanol, we're talking about a $3.5 billion export rising to $4 billion in 2024. That's, that's, more, that's about a 15% increase year over year in the overall value of ethanol exports. Meyer says ethanol export values this year could match the record set in 2022 and in terms of volume could break the record of 1.6 billion gallons set in 2018. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture.
In today's national spotlight, even though the U.S. heavily relies on imports for key fertilizer minerals, they aren't on the critical minerals list. David Geiger has this report. There is a push to get key farm products on a critical minerals list. Corey Rosenbush, president of the Fertilizer Institute, testified before the House Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources, saying phosphate and potash are two of three essential nutrients for ag productivity. And we must ensure that these critical minerals can be accessed. Deficiencies in any of these nutrients will lead to crop yield failure, and our global partners have recognized that. Both Canada and the European Union have put these minerals on their own critical minerals list. In the U.S., critical minerals are defined as essential to economic or national security of the U.S. and have supply chain vulnerabilities. The U.S. only accounts for about 7% of global fertilizer production, and we are a net importer of fertilizer. As a matter of fact, over 90% of all fertilizers are actually used outside the United States, making U.S. farmers even more vulnerable to supply shocks. Belarus and Russia supply 40% of the total world potash production, with only 12 other countries as options. Rosenbush says the U.S. relies on global markets for potash. 95% is imported. We are fortunate that we do indeed get 80% of our potash from Canada. However, Canada is not immune from supply chain disruptions. For example, in 2023, we curtailed shipments and production of potash because of a dock worker strike. And there are only 11 major phosphate producing countries. China and Morocco are the two largest producers combined at about 58% of the market. Rosenbush says the U.S. frequently imports phosphate to meet producer demand. And permitting is perhaps our biggest challenge to accessing these minerals. One recent permitting example of a phosphate mine in Idaho required 10 years and $36 million to complete. I'm David Geiger reporting. The U.S. is a partner with world organizations that are trying to boost food safety and reduce food-related illness. Gary Crawford has more. It was back in December of 2018 when the United Nations voted to organize a World Food Safety Day, which would be held every June 7th, starting in 2019. The purpose? To raise awareness and inspire action on food safety across the world in order to reduce instances of foodborne illness. Which is a big problem globally, according to Dr. Emilio Esteban. He's the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Undersecretary for Food Safety. He gave us some shocking numbers. Around the globe, around 600 million people get sick uh, because of food illness every year. About 420,000 of those, almost half a million people, die because of foodborne illnesses. And so Dr. Esteban says U.S. and international groups are working together to set food safety standards and help countries, particularly low-income countries, meet those standards to reduce food-related illnesses. We're working together to make safe food for, for the world. But he says food-related illness is not just a problem of low-income countries. Even though the U.S. has the safest food system in the world, we still have some of those food-related illnesses here in the U.S. as well. About 48 million cases a year, many of them caused by us consumers not being careful, not following basic food safety guidelines. The director of the World Health Organization's Nutrition and Food Safety Office, Dr. Francesco Branca, talked about what we consumers should do when handling food. First of all, of course, hygiene. Wash. Wash your hands. Wash the food, the surfaces. Wash your products, the fruit and vegetables you eat, particularly if you eat them raw. Then separate the raw from the cooked. When you prepare food, when you store food. Then third, uh, you, you have to uh, cook food thoroughly at the right temperature. And store it at the right temperature as well. What are the right temperatures? How can we make sure we're handling food safety? Luckily, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has experts you can ask at the department's meat and poultry hotline. Meredith Carruthers is one of those experts, and here's how to get your food safety questions answered. So if you want to talk to a live food safety expert, you can call us on the meat and poultry hotline. We're open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time. You can reach us at the phone on, you know, at 1-888-674-6854. So it's 1-888-MP-HOTLINE. You can also live chat with us same times Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time at ask.usda.gov. If you have any questions, you know, when we're not open or not available live, you can send us an email at mphotline at usda.gov. And then we do have food safety messages, you know, FAQs, questions and answers that you can search 24 hours a day as well at Ask USDA. 
That's ask.usda.gov. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Non-farming land investment companies are reshaping some rural communities in Canada. Dennis Guy has more. While large established family farms still make up the majority of buyers of farmland in Canada, pension fund investors and corporate buyers from outside the agricultural sector are putting ever larger financial investment into productive farmland. The standard business model is for the investor to purchase the land and then to lease that land back to be farmed. The tenant farmer is often the original farmer owner. Or, if the original farm owner has retired, typically neighboring farm operators will lease the land from the new farmland owner investor. Andre Magnan, a sociology professor at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, studies the growing influence of corporate ownership of farmland across Canada. Professor Magnan says that non-farming corporate ownership of land is still relatively new to rural communities, but absentee landlords are slowly replacing the old community-based model. Traditionally, your landlord was your neighbor or someone else in the community who owned land and perhaps was retired. There was a more of a direct personal relationship between a farmer, tenant, and the landlord. Now your landlord may have their head office on Bay Street or somewhere else, and so those investor owners aren't in the community. Southwestern Ontario, between Lake Huron and Lake Erie, has seen much of the corporate ownership investment acquisition in recent years. Land values have risen 60% between 2020 and 2023 for an average per acre price now at $35,000, out of reach for many farmers and especially young farmers. So, some farm operators are viewing long-term leasing as more feasible. Toronto-based company Bonifield is the country's largest farm real estate investment corporation. Bonifield currently owns 140,000 acres across seven Canadian provinces, valued at nearly $1.5 billion, according to its website. As a sociologist, Professor Magnan's primary concern is not so much that farmland ownership is being lost at the local level. He says that increased farmland values were bound to attract outside investor attention. Andre Magnan's larger concern is that this change to more corporate ownership of farmland will only continue to erode the dwindling populations of rural communities. There is a risk that this type of alternative financing model is speeding up some of the consolidation that we see. And as those farms get bigger and fewer, that emptying out of the countryside will continue. I don't think it's fair to blame investors for this phenomenon, but it's going to continue to encourage that consolidation and the depopulation of rural communities. Reporting from Canada, I'm Dennis Guy. This is the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agonet West headlines, here's Brian German. UC Davis will be ending its strawberry licensing agreements with Eurosemias, which previously managed older UC Davis strawberry varieties outside the U.S. UC Davis reports that the decision to terminate the UC Davis Public Strawberry Breeding Program licensing agreement with Eurosemias did not come lightly. Eurosemias was provided due notice about its default on its agreements, and the university's concerns were not addressed. UC Davis aims to ensure continued access to these varieties for nurseries and growers during the transition, with newer varieties to remain available through other partners. With 20 active patents, UC Davis has been a global leader in developing strawberry varieties and providing significant contributions to global strawberry markets. Varieties from UC Davis make up about 60% of global consumption and have helped California produce over 87% of North America's strawberries. There's a bit of concern in the equipment manufacturing sector. According to a recent market outlook from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, lower commodity prices, higher storage and input costs have reduced farmers' margins, leading to a decreased demand for agricultural equipment. Elevated equipment prices and a loss of U.S. market share have also contributed to the decline. However, with inflation no longer rising and supply chain pressures easing, economic recovery is anticipated sooner than previously expected. Demand is increasing for irrigation systems, sprayers, loaders, material handlers, trailers, and transportation equipment, while at the same time there's a decrease in demand for equipment related to soil working, seeding, fertilizing, and plant protection. 
Altogether, year-to-date agricultural equipment sales are lower compared to the previous year, potentially marking a second consecutive year of declining demand. Strengthening foreign economies puts additional pressure on the U.S. ag labor pool. Leader of the Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Team in North America, Roland Fumazi, explained what happens when economies improve in areas the U.S. relies on for labor. Yeah, so when you look at the underlying demographics, it's really this juxtaposition of better economic conditions and growing economies in emerging markets and developing countries is good for, for food demand, particularly the types of, of things that California produces, right? Higher value products. As incomes go up, people can afford and, and want more of those types of products. The flip side of that coin is those same phenomenon make our ag labor challenge even worse because as economies develop, birth rates go down. And so you're, you're adding fewer younger people. And so as you go through time, uh, the average population gets older. You stop adding as many people to that, that kind of prime ag working age. And if you go out far enough, the data we looked at today, you know, you go into that, say, 2040 to 2050, in many countries that we rely on for ag labor, that prime demographic, that prime age group um, actually starts to decline, right? And that's where we really start to run into issues. So it's an issue in Mexico. It's an issue in Central America, South America. It's a bit of an issue in South Africa, uh, which has become an important place where we're pulling uh, H-2A labor from uh, in the United States. The site's reservoir project is moving forward after a judge dismissed a lawsuit from environmental groups. The project is backed by President Joe Biden, Governor Gavin Newsom, and various water agencies. Environmental groups, including Friends of the River and the Center for Biological Diversity, had argued that the project would harm endangered fish by diverting too much water from the Sacramento River. However, the court disagreed and found that the final environmental impact report for the site's project was legally adequate. Environmentalists expressed disappointment in the ruling, stating their intentions to continue objecting to the project. Construction of site's reservoir is scheduled to start in 2026 and finish by 2032. Thus far, the project's had significant funding support, including $519 million from the federal government, a $2.2 billion EPA loan, and $875 million from state funds. Registration is open for a stockmanship and stewardship event coming up in October. The tour will be stopping in Fresno October 18th and 19th at the Fresno State Animal Sciences Pavilion. Funded in part by the Beef Checkoff, the event is a unique educational experience for cattle producers featuring low-stress cattle handling demonstrations, beef quality assurance training, facility design sessions, and industry updates. During the event, attendees can become BQA and BQA Transportation Certified, network with fellow cattle ranchers and beef producers, participate in hands-on demonstrations led by animal handling experts, and learn innovative management techniques. More information about the event, including a complete agenda and instructions for how to register, is available at stockmanshipandstewardship.org. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Supporting community wildfire defense efforts, that's coming up on this line of hours. Selected communities now have assistance in developing wildfire defense plans, thanks in part to recently awarded U.S. Forest Service grants. Rod Bain has more. As communities in urban forest interface areas prepare for potential wildfire threats, one tool that can assist is USDA Community Wildfire Defense Grants. Brad Simpkins of the U.S. Forest Service says the latest round of such grants have been awarded. We pushed out about $250 million for round two, and that funded 158 applications out of those 535. Funding actually went to 31 different states, 11 tribes, and two territories. This is year two of the Community Wildfire Defense Grant Program and its focus on wildfire response plans is part of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy and aligned with the National Climate Resilience Framework. It's really meant to do things before a wildfire starts. It's how do you decrease fuels, create fire breaks, prevention, etc., to get ready and try to mitigate the risk before the fire ever occurs. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Chuck Zimmerman. At the Modern Ag on the Mall event taking place in Washington, D.C., I have Jeremy with me from Ag Gateway. And Jeremy, tell me, uh, 
you know, your name, title, and what you're doing for Ag Gateway. Yeah, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, as well as North American Director for Ag Gateway. Well, let's talk about a meeting coming up here for Ag Gateway. It's called the Mid-Year. Uh, they're uh, near Des Moines in Altoona. Uh, who comes to this meeting, and what are the kinds of things you do while you're at the Mid-Year? So at the Mid-Year meeting, Chuck, it's, it's a working session. Uh, we have a lot of different working groups that meet and work on different items that we have as priorities um, right now. The, and we have a wide array of, of who attends. A lot of it is, is the folks out of the IT staff and, and other people that's actually working with the data um, within these organizations. We have leadership of some of the companies that attend as well, but this is probably more of a more working session. Uh, less, you know, we think about the annual conference as kind of a review of everything we did. This is more of a, of a working session. So from last year to this year, you've had a lot of things going on. We have. We have a lot of working groups finish up work that we're doing, and then we're launching a lot of new working groups now. Uh, we've had two or three call for participations here in just the last couple of weeks. You know, some of the ones I'll call out is uh, the Entity ID, uh, which is a, around the grower, GLNs, and global location numbers, and duplications we have within our system, and how do we, how do we alleviate those. Uh, we've also had a call for participation around, um, I'll call it data ethics, I guess. Uh, we wrote a data white paper several years ago, um, back probably 2000, gosh, 16, 17 now, uh, prior to a lot of the autonomy and other things, and we're just going to revisit that. I'm not going to guarantee there's going to be any radical changes, but we're going to revisit it. We also have uh, some field boundary working groups meetings. We've been we've had a couple working groups already in that. We've got another one in the works right now of let's just call it like some of the basic data around a, a boundary. You know, we've defined the boundary already, the different types of boundary. Now we're talking about some of the di- different attributes of that boundary. So we you know we've got uh, I think it's 50 plus uh, exhibitors here. Uh, from John Deere to um, some of the uh, alternative energy uh, organizations. Um, this seems like a pretty good place to be talking about Ag Gateway to some of these folks too, right? It has been a really good event, Chuck. We've had a lot of opportunities not only to interact with our you know, Congress uh, folks and, and the legislative assistants. You know, we've had some different directors out of the different departments has come through. But just even an opportunity to network with some of our members and potential members about the work we've done. And, you know, we've just had a, a, a lot of really good meetings with folks and talking about areas that we could work on. And this whole reporting is, is kind of changing right before our eyes. And, and it's going to impact our entire customer base. You know, and and I say customer base, I should say our membership, because whether you're an ag retailer, you're a manufacturer, you know, some of these new reporting requirements are going to impact it. And we need, there's some work we need to do to be able to meet the needs of this new style reporting. Well, I know that you have some members who are represented here. Uh, For them or or other members, they can still get involved and go to the mid-year meeting? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's a pretty cost-effective way to get brought up on t- to speed on what's happened in the industry over the last, in some cases, six months. Maybe you haven't been there for a year. Maybe you've never been there at all. Um, you know, registration fee is minimal. Uh, come and visit and, and just reach out. You know, you can go to our website. We've got several different ways on our website you can get connected with us and one of us. And, and it's just really a good opportunity for Somewhere close to home for a lot of people. Uh, being out Altoona, Iowa, we have a lot of people that drive into this meeting. And uh, just come visit and learn what we're doing. So you connect and you use good connectivity, right? We try hard, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's, the, that's our whole mission is bringing com- complete industry-wide data interoperability so that these people can connect to those valued partners within the industry that they need to share data with. That, that's what drives me every day, Chuck. All right, Jeremy, thank you very much for taking a couple minutes to talk to me about the Ag Gateway Mid-Year Meeting coming up. Here from Washington, D.C., I'm Chuck Zimmerman reporting. This segment is brought to you by Live Earth Products. To get to know a little more about Live Earth Products, we're talking on the phone today with Vice President Russell Taylor. For the Conservationist of the Year, what goals would you like to see occur this year? So this is continuing work as the Certified Crop Advisor Conservationist of the Year. They're looking for uh, certified crop advisors who are trying to aid farmers in getting information or conservation practices. One thing we've identified that is keeping farmers from getting 
conservation practices is actually just information and products. The current federal regulations actually were written in the 1950s. And at that time, those rules were only restricting fertilizers and pesticides. They didn't put into account other developing technologies such as plant biostimulants and some of these newer technologies we're using in agriculture. And so for 2024, our goal is to really help change the laws that are impacting biostimulant regulation to allow them to be used and treated as a fertilizer, not as a pesticide. So what does that process look like to go through that and get that change to be where it needs to be? Well, it's actually, there's a very long on-ramp. We've been working on this since 2014. And the bricks that we've laid uh, on this path are now being hopefully being included in the farm bill. So more than anything now, it's just supporting the work we've already done, trying to get legislators aware of the problem and, and hopefully enact those rules. There's an act right now by California regulators it's called the uh, Plant Biostimulant Act. And so the best thing that farmers can do is call up and say, hey, we support this language. This is going to give us more tools to enact those conservation practices and have more products available to us. To get to know more about Live Earth products, you can visit them online at liveearth.com. That is spelled L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. The Agriculture Secretary last week announced expanded and new projects focused on tribal food sovereignty and resource management. Rod Bain reports. A series of announcements by Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack Wednesday associated with USDA efforts to advance food sovereignty for tribal nations, including... We're announcing a grant of $2.3 million to five Native-led organizations that will help school nutrition officials across the United States better understand and appreciate the need to serve foods that are more in line with the indigenous foods that tribal communities are anxious to have incorporated in school meals. Other announcements by the Secretary at the National Congress of American Indians centered on grants to expand meat processing capabilities in tribal nations for traditional game and fish, as well as a new USDA internship program focused on education on tribal agricultural and food sovereignty matters. Also announced efforts to expand on the 180 tribal co-stewardship agreements that we've entered into. We're announcing 23 projects under our co-stewardship arrangement, $18.4 million being provided to tribes. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. This is the Agnet News Hour. We'll be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. Here is today's featured interview. My name is Jackie Katka, and I am the industry analyst for farm supply and biofuels at CoBank. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about trade today, and I know that um, you've been keeping your eye on a few things, and I'd like to talk to start out with talking about China. Um, you know, the U.S. has seen a decline in some of our exports, and that is due, uh, you know, largely because of um, China taking fewer of our exports and I believe getting more from Brazil. Can we talk a little bit about that? And I'd like to get your, you know, educated eye on, on, on that topic. Yeah, so China, this this kind of de- downward spiral of our exports is not new this year, but I think this year we're finally feeling uh, the the real hit uh, because our soybean exports to China are already down 23% for the fiscal year. Uh, corn exports to China are down 67%. Uh, you know, we built up a lot of our soybean demand uh, to China and a combination of what started during the Trump era has been built upon uh, during the Biden administration. Uh, Our relations with China are not good. And the farmers are the ones that are paying the price for that in lower exports. And, you know, part of that is because of a lot of the talk, you know, even some of the discussion about foreign land ownership and really the targeting of China, you know, that doesn't bode well over there. It doesn't make them think, oh, let's go buy some soybeans from the U.S. when they're they're constantly hearing us kind of banter against them. And, you know, they have been investing for decades in Brazil and Argentina. And I was just having a conversation this week with some of our staff, too, about how the competitiveness for U.S. agriculture was because of our transportation and the way that we could get our products across the world to China. Well, China started investing in Brazil and Argentina. And so 
our competitiveness is is now feeling that impact of that investment, as well as we've seen great weather for Brazil and Argentina for the most part that that had erased some of the problems that they'd had in recent years. So again, overall, we're taking a big hit from China and I don't anticipate that being able to come back unless we see other uh, shortfalls in, in the Southern American market. You hit on so many different aspects of this and you know, first off, like you said, it started in the with the Trump administration, continued in the Biden administration with, um, you know, uh, with trade issues, and then, but also, as you said, that kind of banter or just the general feeling attitude that we have had with China with preventing um, the ag land and you know talking about foreign ownership of ag land, uh, primarily centered around China. Um, and now we're looking at with the election coming up. You know, we're truly looking at either continuing with the Biden administration or going back into the Trump administration, uh, how can, any ideas on how we can possibly recover or bring that trade with China, which is very important to our farmers, what can we do to increase that or make it better? To be completely honest, I think a lot of the damage is done. Uh, and I think the biggest opportunity for us probably exists if there is a weather concern in our competitors. I don't think uh, if if they had to choose between us and them, uh, they're not going to choose us. Um, and, and I think that is another reason why, uh, you know, there's a lot of momentum here in the U.S. for renewable diesel and possibly being able to build up our domestic demand for soybeans. But as we look uh, going forward, the damage has been done and a lot of that has been years in the making and like i mentioned with the building up of the transportation and being able for those brazilian farmers to be able to get their crops from the field to their ports and out uh you know that used to be a, a, a advantage that we could have we don't necessarily have that in some of those areas so I don't think there's a magic wand that's going to fix this. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to find some new demand here and and look to some of those other Southeast Pacific uh, areas uh, to send our our crops. Yeah. And again, we're talking with Jesse, uh, talking with Jackie Fatka of Cobank, and I just want to point out that um, you are you have taken the time to talk with us today while you're currently at an airport. We do have a little bit of that background noise going on, so I just want to let our listeners know what it is. And I really appreciate you taking the time out um, to speak with us. So, you know, let's, speaking of taking a trip, let's take a trip from China to Mexico. Now, Mexico has had a change in leadership. And with that, we've seen a drop with the, the peso. How can that affect things? You know, right now, uh, we've been able to have a competitive, uh, the, the dollar to peso ratio has been favorable to exports there, especially with corn. We've seen a lot of our corn go to, to Mexico. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with so many headwinds that, that the industry is facing, you know, that was really a tailwind, right? It was kind of giving us some boost. Um, but a weaker peso longer term may actually slow U.S. grain exports to Mexico, so corn in particular. So, you know, that's one thing we're watching there with the, the recent election there. Um, but also, too, I mean, lots of people with with Mexico, we know that there is the GMO concerns, and that's going through the USMCA trade dispute process right now. Um, this newly elected president is uh, a, a very close ally of her predecessor, and so there is some questions of whether she would continue that going forward or whether she would relax that. She's a scientist, and so maybe she would be able to kind of see where things go through the trade dispute. But when she comes into office later this fall, uh, maybe would reevaluate the, the country's position on GMO corn. Yeah, and having that scientist perspective, that could actually be a really good thing for the GMO corn perspective because she understands the GMOs. That's my take on it. I'm, you know, like, it's not necessarily what I've read, but that's it. My take is that a scientist is going to understand that and be able to argue better for permitting the GMO corn into Mexico. And um, that would be beneficial for our farmers as well, wouldn't it? Definitely. I mean, and, and 
we've been able to kind of scale that back of the the fact that at one point you know we didn't know if we'd be able to send any corn and you know now it was just corn that was going to be used in their food so a smaller chunk right you know if we weren't able to send any of our corn for their feeding then it would really be a problem um but you know this is something that's really important not just for the relationship with us and mexico but around the world right you know the the biotechnology the science behind it is really under scrutiny in this case and so it's going to have an impact not just with Mexico trade, but possibly all around the world uh, in, in the continued uh, just knowledge and understanding of the safety that comes with GMO corn. Yeah. And, you know, let's talk about ethanol a little bit, um, just to hit on it a bit with eth um, ethanol exports and trade. Uh, how How is that going with um, building it up? Yeah, so just, you know, this week we had new numbers out for April and uh, again, uh, very high uh, exports that we're seeing probably going to exceed the 200 million gallon mark for only the second time in history. Uh, and we're seeing some robust demand for really uh, big markets. Um, you know, some of that is these countries around the world that are creating their own renewable fuel incentives programs to increase the blending amounts. Uh, Canada has been a, a good market there. Uh, and, and again, just being able to take our domestic product, uh, do something with it. So taking our domestic corn and and sending it around the world. Uh, you, We started off our conversation about China. Uh, you know, as we look at the overall U.S. ag trade out look. Uh, there was just a quarterly release last week. Ethanol was one of the few that actually is seeing an increase. So we, uh, the USDA updated higher the outlook for ethanol exports going forward, and we could actually surpass our, our previous record, both in volume and, and value. All right. And as we wrap up, are there any other thoughts that you have today or anything else that you think that our listeners would like to know about trade? You know, I think uh, we in here in the U.S. really do rely on our trade, and uh, we know that both the Biden and Trump administration have have had a different approach to trade than maybe we had seen in the previous decades before. Uh, so we here in the U.S. need to continue to to push for more trade opportunities. You know, this is an opportunity for producers and commodity groups to continue to make that that important message to carry it and, and, and communicate how important these export markets are for their bottom line. And, you know, also it, it puts a notice on us to make sure that we have new demand here in the U.S. If we're not going to export it around the world, we've got to come up with some new demand, whether that's continued exports of ethanol, whether that's renewable diesel, uh, or, you know, trying to replace other plastics with some of these products as well. Well, I want to thank you one more time. Like I said, I know that you were you are busy, you're, you're on the road today. So thank you for taking a few minutes out to chat with us and to get us caught up on some of these issues. It was great chatting with you, Sabrina. Feel free to reach out anytime. You are listening to the Agnet News Hour. Now for more news. The Farm Service Agency partners with a private entity to offer an online tool for producers wishing for more details on one of USDA's more flexible disaster assistance programs. Rod Bain has more. Now available, the latest online tool to assist ag producers impacted by natural disasters gain access to USDA support programs. As Farm Service Agency Administrator Zach Ducheneau explains, the tool developed in conjunction with FarmRaise focuses on FSA emergency assistance for livestock, honeybees, and farm-raised fish program. ELAP is likely our most flexible tool that we have to support producers in that there's a lot of discretion conferred to the secretary, so we've been able to really Really expand that critical safety net tool for producers. The Farm Raise FSA educational hub and decision making tool follows the rollout of a similar online resource for the livestock indemnity program. The Farm Raise FSA educational hub can be found at this web address www.farmraise all one word dot com slash USDA dash FSA. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's Top Agriculture News. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit AgNetWest online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at AgNetWest on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halverson on Facebook and Twitter. 
Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.